Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Senators Roundtable. I'm your host, Jacob Billington, and I'm joined with Paul Quinney and Dayton Reimer, as per usual. Um, first things first, I just want to let everybody know that we have uh, expanded our offerings to the Substack platform, and we have the the Hockey Writers Ottawa Senators Substack. So if you're looking for the best Senators content available to you, um, you can subscribe for free and just get all of our articles weekly uh, into your mailbox twice a week. You can get some premium subscription offers, which include um, mailbags and special articles and all that kind of stuff, pregame reports. It's all fantastic stuff. So if you're interested in that, the link will be down in the description. We have free, we have paid, and we have the opportunity to earn yourself a paid subscription. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check that out. Um, so before we get into our conversation, how are you guys doing? How are you doing, Paul? Hey, really good, Jacob. I'm uh, tearing up the uh, beer league I play in better than a goal a game. There's there's hope for my career yet. Just really look out, Austin Matthews. There we go. <laughs> Stuff we love to see. <laughs> How you doing, Dayton? Oh, you know, um, showed up an hour early for the recording <laughs> of this podcast because I forgot times change in different provinces. So that's that's fun to realize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't want to spend any time on it because we could go on for hours, but daylight savings is ridiculous and we just need to abolish it at some point. And I think that it is coming soon. Um, obviously, Saskatchewan, you were way out there west. Yeah. You got rid of it and probably way better quality of life without it. You know, oh, I think so. Time. Yes. You like the worst part about everything is that I have to change my stove clock. Like everything else is automatic, but I have to change my stove all the time. It's ridiculous. Well, how's the uh, how's the black cat? Uh, how's the black cat uh, doing, Dayton? Because I I know the time change is tough on uh, pets out here. Uh, you know, I used to have a dog. It was five o'clock is five o'clock. You know, whether you change yeah. the clocks or not. But yeah. yeah, well, with with no time change, cat seems to be doing all right. It's <laughs> weirdly enough not on like a feeding schedule, which is weird to say for like a cat. They are so schedule oriented. But he's just like, yeah, I'll eat when I'm what. And we kind of roll with that. So, well, it hey, works. Yeah. Maybe we'll um, see him on tonight's, on tonight's recording. Maybe. He's been wandering. So, you, <laughs> you never know. So, like I said, welcome back to the SPCA podcast. Um, we're here to talk about all of our pets and animals and daylight savings. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> no, so let's get into some Senators news. Um, there's been a whole in the Senators news. Yeah. Um, there's been a bunch of it, no time to waste here. Um, a lot has happened since our last episode. Um, we talked about the potential of DJ Smith or sorry, Pierre Dorian being fired after the Evgeny Dadanov stuff. Um, we had Sean Simpson on, make sure to go check that out. And I'll even plug his podcast here, Simmer Down. Um, first two episodes have been fantastic. I've, I've been listening to it. I've been enjoying it. Um, so yeah, very thankful for his time coming on the podcast um, but then the next day, Pierre Dorian got fired. So we were a day late on some real big news happening with Simmer on. Um, but real quick, just everybody's already given their thoughts everywhere. But what do you like? What do you think of the move, Paul? I, I don't think there's any choice. You know, yeah. with uh, Dad and Off screw up, uh, that's a fireable offense. And, uh, you know, for them, they were probably looking for something for some reason to pull the trigger. And hey, they got it. So they took advantage of it. Yeah, exactly. And based on what Sean and other people have said, it seems like Pierre Dorian straight up lied. Um, it was not like he forgot or he genuinely thought that it wasn't submitted on time. He straight up lied about it. And that's ridiculous. What do you think, Dayton? Yeah, uh, with that announcement that they lost a first round pick, it was 100% going to happen. Uh, there was no way around it. It, from the comments from Andlauer and Steos, it sounded like they wanted to hold on a little longer. Yeah, They didn't want to fire him in, well, was it November or was it right at the end of October? It would have been still October. Yeah. Uh, no, it would have been November 1st because we recorded on Halloween with Simmer. Yeah, right. Yes. So anyways, barely a month into the season and they already have to find a new GM. They didn't want that. They wanted to, at least that's what my read was. They wanted to wait a little longer before getting into it. And now that's that's their top priority. They want that two-headed monster, like Andlauer says. So yeah, it's it's definitely made things tricky to start the season. 
Yeah. Um, and speaking of tricky start to the season, uh, the Senators are one in five in their last six. Welcome to November, folks. This is how things go in Ottawa. Um, like I, I think the record is like five twenty one and two in November over the past three years so far. Like that's abysmal. That's three years without playoffs gone in November. Um, you can't win the Stanley Cup, but you sure can lose it. It's everybody says it all the time, and it is very true. So I I think a change needs to be made. I think a lot of people think a change needs to be made behind the bench. Brady Kachuk does not. So um, we all, it's been spiraling all around the internet for the past few days. Um, but I am going to read the full quote just in case, just to keep you fully up to speed. Um, so Brady Kachuk in the media uh, after the team was booed off the ice against Tampa Bay. Um, and there was plenty of fire DJ chants going on in the Canadian Tire Center. Uh, the quote is, it's frustrating. And whenever you don't win, it's frustrating. Kachuk said. It's frustrating the negativity from the outside, the constant booing and all the bull. You can finish that yourself, uh, kind of from the crowd tonight. So he really did not like hearing the boos, um, really upset him, which is kind of a good thing. So he continued on and said, I understand that they're passionate, that it's a passionate fan base. And I understand and I love it. He loves how passionate the fan base is. But when you face adversity, you don't turn your back on the guys out there. We're playing hard. I know how frustrating it is right now. It's not like we're giving up the out there. We're fighting right to the very end. And he used the word frustrating, I think, eight times in 98 seconds or something like that. He is very frustrated. And I think that it's going to start showing on the ice. Showing your true colors as a captain and, and already an emotional guy like Brady Kachuk. I like this kind of stuff. Now, calling out the fan base and saying what he said and whatnot, maybe that crossed the line. I know, Paul, you think that it crossed the line. So let's start with you, Dayton. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about it before the podcast, trying to get like, what what is my side on this? Because it's, it's kind of like, it's sort of a gray little area. Because on one hand, 100%, the players should be defending their coaches. That's a good situation. The fans should be vocal about their support because that means they're passionate fans. So it's a good situation. It's just an ugly result of a team not performing and the players getting, they hear it. Like clearly they hear it. I Yeah. So I think, I think this is a good sign that's emerged from a bad situation. We've got a, like a, there's a passionate fan base in Ottawa. And there's a, a really dedicated, hardworking team that is yeah. just not clicking and they're frustrated that it's not working. Yeah. And those are butting heads right now, which is which is sad to see. But I think it's overall a good situation, which feels weird to say. Yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of where I sit. Well, I mean, and I, I think the point you're trying to make, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it's growing pains. This is a very young team. They need to go through this kind of stuff to kind of realize that, listen, it's not all just fun and games out there. We need to pull up our pants sometimes, and we need to we need to really just put our nose down and get the job done. Yeah, there is a sense of growing pains, but Claude Giroux was also coming out against the fan base a little bit too. I'm not sure if we're getting to that later, but... I, we, I was reading his comments about how he's sticking up for DJ and sticking up for Kachuk. Yeah. He's a veteran guy. He should be a little bit more experienced in this. So I don't know if it's growing pains, but again, I, I don't know if it's a bad thing. Yeah. It's just not a great situation. Yeah. And I, I do have some comments to say about Giroux, um, but I know that you have a lot to say about this, Paul, enough to write a full article about. Um, so you can give us the, the kind of rundown on your stance of this. Well, you know, I, I think it takes a lot of cheek for uh, for to Chuck to um, rebuke the fan base. I mean, the reality is here, uh, Ottawa fans have got every right to boo the Senators. Uh, they're a 400 hockey team. Uh, they're a bottom dweller again, and they've likely played themselves out of a out of a playoff spot this is uh living in this town is like uh living living the scene out of uh the movie groundhog day right i mean it's every november 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, when you look at the dollars, hundreds of dollars that Ottawa fans fork over to buy those tickets, uh, drive out to Canada, uh, pay outrageous prices for food and drink and team gear. Um, yeah. And, and to, to see them in this situation, once again, despite all the hype, yep. uh, I, I think, you know what? When you're running a business, and this is a business, it's it's the entertainment business, but a business nevertheless. But when you put a crummy product out on the ice the way the senators have, this the fans, the only way they can let you know their dissatisfaction is booing. And the right response isn't to uh, rebuke them for their boos. Take a page from the Zadorov in um, in yeah. Calgary, right? He just came out and said, we stink, and I'm sorry. And Edmonton did the same thing. Darnell, Darnell Nurse did the same yep. thing. So, you know, I think the kid's throwing a hissy fit. This is Canada. It's a really tough place to play. When you don't perform, the fans are going to boo. Uh, I think every Canadian team, with the exception of Winnipeg, has been booed this season. So, Hey, look, Brady, if you don't like being booed and nobody does, then there's a solution here. It's to go out, play hard, work hard, and start winning games. It's as simple as that. That's yeah. my reason. Yeah, and it's it, it's time to just get these wins. Like, they, I don't care how they do it. Um, it's just, yeah, I don't know. It's Something's got to change, whether you think it's behind the bench, whether you think it's on the ice. It's something something's gonna give. Well, what definitely doesn't seem like the losses are coming because of lack of hard work. Yeah, right. Kachuk and um and Co are incredibly hard workers. Yeah, but things just aren't bouncing right, and I don't like the team is incredibly talented. You can't fault them for that. Everyone was looking at this team. It's like this is borderline playoffs. Yeah, Stutzla should get a hundred points. Uh. Kachuk should get like 40 goals. No one was questioning those um those predictions. So the team is talented. The work is there. So what's going on? What is happening that the team can't win games? You got to point the finger somewhere and well the GM was already dealt with. What's next? Well, well, yeah, but, you know, uh, DJ is who I think you're going to point the finger at, Dayton. But, uh, look, he's not out on the ice. And what I saw in St. Louis was those guys got out to a terrible start. They fell behind. I don't know where the hell they went in the second period to sleep. And, you know, I, if I were an Ottawa fan, I'd be getting a little tired of the shtick where they come out and in the last part of the third period, they go put on these great heroic efforts and then pat themselves on the back for, uh, by God, we don't quit. We're, uh, I, come on, this is the NHL and these guys are making big dollars and moral victories, which they keep claiming every game they lose and they're losing most of them. Uh, that doesn't cut it in this league. So oh, no, you moral know. victories won't win you a Stanley Cup. Uh, no. Your your description though sounds very, and I'm gonna get burnt for this. It sounds very Maple Leafs. <laughs> well, I, I've I've been I've been accused of uh, yeah I yeah I've been accused of being a Toronto uh, media. So oh uh, same in <laughs> Saskatoon I've been accused of being Toronto media. It's that's awesome. Great yeah, <laughs> but yeah I was one of the SDPN podcasts was talking about how this team, their team um, goes out and will just, they're famous for coming back and, you know, tying it up or almost winning. Is that not the senators this year? It's. Yeah. You know what? You're banging on yeah. with that, honestly. And I, I, I was starting to think that too. Cause um, yeah, like it's, there's no moral victories. Like you said, sure. It's important to kind of acknowledge those when you get them, but they're not going to get you anything. Like they don't, they don't mean anything. No. Great, great for Twitter users and Twitter trolls to just kind of go at you with. But like, other than that, it's, they're not worth anything. Yeah. I, I think the, the players, I mean, you know, I'm, they'll talk a good line about what a great team they are, how they stick together, fight to the end. But uh, 
I've seen huge lapses, uh, their inability to clear the puck, uh, kind of a lack of discipline, uh, lousy play up the boards. These are um, these are details uh, that they've got to pay attention to, and and they're not. So, yeah. you know, is it because uh, DJ's not holding them accountable? Possibly, but you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of ours, uh, myself here, but. So the the latest thing to kind of come out about this whole DJ Smith debacle is uh, today, like you mentioned, Dayton, Claude Giroux come out and I have that quote in front of me as well. Um, so when asked about um, just what what the vibe is like right now around the, the whole fire DJ and that the team is struggling and stuff. And remember, it was uh, four games ago that Claude Giroux said it's not time to hit the panic button yet. And since then, the Senators are one in three. I wonder if he changed his mind a little bit. Things are not looking very good. Um but yeah, his quote today was that it's getting pretty old. The fans in the media are talking about DJ. It's frustrating, actually. He's our coach. He's not going anywhere. We want to play for him. It's our dis- or, sorry. It's a distraction that we don't need right now. So the biggest thing I take away from that is that Claude Giroux, a very, very well-respected veteran in the NHL, is coming out and saying he's not going anywhere. I don't imagine that that's just Claude's opinion. I think that he he knows that DJ Smith is sticking around for a little bit. That's interesting. Oh. Yeah, I didn't I didn't read that on the first pass through. So so what I'd say to that to Giroux is okay. Uh, you claim you, everybody wants to play for DJ. DJ's a great guy. Yeah. Well, you're sure as hell not showing it on the ice. Yeah, you're not demonstrating that. So I think that's a bit of a crock. And then. You know, boo-hoo. Uh, Giroux's complaining that all the talk about firing DJ is a distraction and boo-hoo. We don't need that right now. Oh, come on. Uh, yeah. You know, you guys frankly stink and uh, you should hear about it. And for you to say it's a distraction and it's upsetting us, I guess, is the inference is a bit rich for me. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. What do they want to fans to do just shut up and take it um just like the last six years have been yeah yeah dayton you got anything you want to throw into that yeah oh man (laughs) that quote is disheartening yeah i don't like seeing a veteran leader like Giroux say that yeah like it's great to stick up for your coach you should stick up for your coach but like you said, how, you know, it's it's this indication that Smith's not going anywhere and that the fans should just shut up and take it. That's not what fans do. Oh, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's what fair weather people do who are just like, oh, yeah, hockey, great, man, nah, whatever. Yeah. That's not a fan. Yeah. That's someone who's just hanging out. Yeah. And they'll move on to the next thing when it comes. Yeah. The Senators have passionate fans who care about this team and who want to see them win and when they're not they're gonna let it let them know as they should and to get really hung up on the fact that there's booze in this building shouldn't be it shouldn't get them to respond with hey hey guys settle down we're we're trying hard we should do this okay it should be like okay yeah Internally, we need to figure out what's going on. Like, why is the coaching not clicking right now? Because all the details that we've talked about so far, that's coaching. Not going hard into the corners, not doing those tiny little things that players wouldn't notice necessarily on while they're on the ice. You need somebody kind of standing above and observing more of that. And so you'd have a coach to point out those things. Clearly, it's not working. Um, I've seen stats about the dump and chase system that DJ employs. <laughs> it's awful. The, the senators have one of the worst dump and chase stats in the entire league. Yeah. Because they're not, those players aren't designed for that. Sure. Kachuk is he'll go yeah. into the corner and beat the tar out of you. Yeah. Because he can, you don't want Timmy Stu going into the corner. That's how you lose him for 40 games. I don't know if Tarasenko has ever played a dump and chase system. No, you you want 
Stutzler, you want Tarasenko carrying that puck in and yep. then setting up. Yeah. And I'm not a coach. I'm not trying to say like, oh, I know better than than yep. a professional who's been doing this for years. But I can notice when a player has a certain style, I've done a little bit of scouting. You want to try to play to that style a little bit, like you adapt, but I don't know. It's, it's, that's the Kachuk thing was like, okay, passionate, uh, bash, passionate captain. He's sticking up for his team. He's taking the heat off. Great. Giroux comes out and says it. That one sucks. Yeah. So I'll, Kind of, I have all of my thoughts wrapped up into a little bit um, on all of this. I, I like to ask for your thoughts and then at the end give mine. Um, I really like what Brady Kachuk said. Uh, I think that what he said is exactly who he is, exactly what his job is as the captain of the Ottawa Senators. Um, and he knows that this is his team. This is his team more than anybody other than Michael Ann Lauer, who physically owns the team. It's not Steve Steos' team, it's not DJ's team, it's not Claude Giroux's team, it's Brady Kachuk's team. It was not Pierre Dorian's team, it was Brady Kachuk's team. He is taking the heat. He is being the leader of the Ottawa Senators. Not just the on-ice product, he's taking all that heat, like you mentioned, Dayton. I really like that. He's sticking up for his guy. Now, the next point I'll make with that is that DJ Smith is all that Brady has known at the NHL level. He really, really likes DJ. He will go to bat for him seven days a week, 24 hours a day. He will always have DJ Smith back. Now, should he? I don't know. There's been a lot of losing during Brady Kachuk's career, but here we are. DJ Smith is a fantastic guy by all accounts. Everybody that has ever spoke about him has said that, except for Michael Delzato, who, if you listen to him on the Cam and Strick podcast, he had some things to say. Um, but... I, I like it from Brady and that's kind of what I expect from Brady. So I get it. No hard feelings with that. I know a lot of fans were kind of, they had their feelings hurt and their heart broken when he said um, to stop booing that he's trying to dictate what they do. I don't care about any of that. That's exactly what Brady's here to do. Claude Giroux is a grizzled veteran who has played under a ton of coaches who knows what it's like to win, not the Stanley cup, but he knows what it's like to have success as a team. Him coming and backing DJ Smith is very frustrating because he should be wanting more than what he's getting in Ottawa. Obviously, last year was great. They missed the playoffs by six points. That's fine at that point in the rebuild. This year, results is all that matters. And they're not getting it. Don't care about who's your buddy, who's your who's not your buddy. I think that this team right now needs a coach that, that they'll hate. Like, honestly... I think John Tortorella would be a perfect coach for this team right now. That is an interesting take. <laughs> yeah, I, I need <laughs> somebody that last will, little bit. Yeah. I need some, but I think this team needs somebody that will hold them accountable that will not just be their best buddy and whatnot. Sure. It's great to have a good relationship with your coach, but if he can't sit you down and say, listen, this is the problem. This is what's going on. You need to solve it or you're getting scratched. Look at Morgan Frost. Now I don't want to see like, <clears throat> I think some comparisons were for Shane Pinto to Morgan Frost. If Pinto was in the lineup, I don't want to see him scratched. But if he's not doing his job, no problem scratching. John Tortorella, sorry, John Tortorella has that accountability piece that a lot of coaches don't. I'm not saying go pluck him from Philadelphia, but a coach like that, or like Rick Tockett in Vancouver, hmm. somebody like that, just like a hard nosed guy that will really tell you how it is. Yeah, I think. Um... If you're talking accountability and holding guys accountable, uh, fine. And I agree with you. Uh, the worst kind of coach, worst kind of manager is your best friend, kind of, uh, you know, a mommy figure. Uh, you can be an SOB. That'll work for a while. Yeah. Uh, but being the best friend, no, it doesn't work. Yep. You can carry that too far. And I'm thinking. Absolutely. Here, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here of uh daryl sutter in yep. calgary and i wrote a piece when i was writing about the flames uh didn't go over very well in the fan base but it basically was uh, you know the title of the piece was um flames could regret choice of sutter as coach yep. and uh 
a guy like that, you know, he's he's infamous for some of his antics in the dressing room with the players. But uh, you eventually lose the room, and he did in less than three years. So as long as Tortorella doesn't cross – a guy like Tortorella doesn't cross that line, and I don't think he would, uh, yeah, that would – that would be a good uh, choice as a, a style of coach for the Senators. Yeah. yeah, like not long-term or anything, just even like a one, two-year kind of just let's get this team in a winning culture because right now it's there's nothing but a losing culture in Ottawa. And yeah. they all say that they're frustrated with it, but they're playing like they're okay with it. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's what really pushes everything over the edge. So there is a whole lot more to talk about, but we're going to take a little quick break. Um, and we will be right back. All right, and we're back. Uh, I just wanted to give everybody a quick reminder to uh, check out the description for the Substack link for the Ottawa Senators Substack hosted by the Hockey Writers. Um, again, some great stuff there and you don't want to miss out on. So talked a whole bunch about DJ Smith. We started taking the conversation a bit too far, and I brought up John Tortorella, Rick Tockett, and whatnot. Um, at least we didn't take it as far as talking about cats and daylight savings time again. Um, <laughs> what's wrong with cats and daylight savings time? Uh, maybe we should host a second podcast all about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I don't like to speculate on somebody who still has a job. Like I remember last week, if you watched that one, Simmer said that doesn't like to cheer for anybody to get fired. Neither do I, but Ottawa needs to change behind the bench. Um, unfortunately me saying that means the same as I hope DJ gets fired. Um, but not cheering for anybody to lose their job. So let's kind of move to somebody that already did lose their job. We talked about it a little bit with Pierre Dorian. Um, again, it's, it's all old news at this point. We're not going to spend too much time on what happened. Um, but Ottawa has a general manager vacancy right now. Steve Steos, who is president of hockey ops is filling in as interim GM. I don't think that that's the long-term plan. I saw some people um, speculating that maybe he is just going to settle into the general manager role and, I thought it was kind of silly because Michael Ann Lauer said that he likes the two headed monster, as he described a president of hockey ops with a GM. Steve Steos wouldn't take a demotion to be GM instead of president. It's I just think that that didn't make sense, but I saw quite a few people talking about it and saying how much that it makes sense. And I, I didn't agree with that, but anyway, um, there are a lot of candidates that have been thrown out there by various sources um, some of them more speculation than others, um, but I'm going to give you six names. We'll talk about them a little bit, and then I'm going to ask you to rank them. Okay, so there's six candidates that have really been thrown out there so far. Um, again, two of them are long shots, but worth throwing in here. Peter Shirelli, first of all. Hall for Larson is everything he's ever been known for, but he's done a lot more than that. He did a good job in Boston until he ended up getting canned. Um and yeah, I, there's a lot of really good things about Peter Shirelli's history. Unfortunately, Hall for Larson is the thing that looms over all of it. What do you think of Peter Shirelli, Paul? Well, you know, he won a cup in 2011, didn't he? In Boston. Uh, but uh, at a high level, I guess, summing up his tenure there, uh, he's best known for some, some trade disasters and really lousy cap management. Sound yeah. familiar? <laughs> no, no idea. <laughs> Any names come to mind? Uh, so, you know, and then if you look at Edmonton, all right, he is in Edmonton, but uh, they've been a disaster for as long as I can remember. And uh, uh, if you look at their record, uh, and the only thing you can give him credit for there is uh, signing Dreisaitl. So mm, I, he might do in a pinch, but he wouldn't come to the top of my list. All right. Interesting. He was, he's been speculated around Steve Steos and Michael and Larry quite a bit. So that's why I wanted to put him at the top of the list. Anything you want to add there, Dayton? Yeah. Uh, Hall for Larson, not that bad of a trade. I agree. I yeah. think it's a very hot take, but I agree. So Larson ended up being a pretty solid shutdown defenseman. Um, and Hall had one really good year and the rest were kind of average. Yeah. I don't know. You could have got more from Hall, but that's not the worst trade. A lot worse is a first and a second for Griffin Reinhardt. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. If Which you want to talk about the worst trade, himself. that was the bad trade. Or how about yeah. Tyler Sagan for 
Louis Erickson, Riley Smith, Joe Morrow, and Matt Frazier. Yeah. That's a bad trade because Erickson lasted three seasons and hit 60 points once yeah. in Boston. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research on Shirelli, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, quite obvious. <laughs> and and the yeah, Paul, the parallels between um a former senator's GM and him are somewhat surprising. Yeah. I, want you yeah, to no, I don't hate it. I think he's an experienced GM. He knows what to do. He doesn't, well, he's, he's learned how not to manage the cap. So you think he has that experience now. Yeah. I hope yeah. so. It's yeah. And he's with the blues right now. So <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so next up on the list, uh, I've got Matthew Darsh. So Elliot Friedman was the first one to throw this name out there, I believe. Um, very, very interesting. He is kind of the the grandson general manager of Steve Yzerman. Steve Yzerman taught um, G- Julian Brisebois everything he knows. Julian Brisebois is passing that information on to Matthew Darsh, who is an assistant GM in Tampa right now. Um, I think that if you can land Darsh, you're – absolutely set that's kind of i think that that's my number one pick not to get into the rankings a little bit too early um i I rescinded that you didn't hear anything um but yeah so dayton any thoughts on bringing darsh into ottawa um i mean yeah he'd be great uh he's got the experience playing with i'm not playing well i guess he did play with tampa but uh working with tampa and steve eiserman and julian brisebois that's great you know, those are great guys to learn from. He doesn't have a ton of experience taking yeah. things on his own, which I would maybe look more towards if the Senators are going for a, a new GM. Okay, and that's generally my thought too. I think Darsh would be the exception there um, just because of who he's learned everything from. Uh, but no, I do agree. I think that a more experienced GM is the way to go right now. Um, Paul, what do you think? I can't disagree with you on Darch. Uh, interesting uh, candidate. Uh, what I like about him, you know, he not much managerial experience, but uh, what I like about him is he was uh, or has been director of hockey operations in Tampa uh, during a period when they won two back-to-back Stanley Cups. So yeah. it's got to count for something in my books. Well, yeah, and like the assistant GM does do things. Um, like it's not like they just sit, like it's not like they're an intern. Like they, right. they do the work. Um, the way you said that though, <laughs> they, they do they, no, they do things. Trust me, <laughs> yeah, please trust me 100%. They do stuff. Um, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Oh, no, I was he assistant GM or or I, I thought it was director of hockey operations or something both. like that, but both, yeah. both, I believe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, next up is hiring internally with Ryan Boness. He is um, assistant general manager right now, I guess. Yeah, to Steve Steos now, which I don't know. That's, that's kind of weird to me. Um, but he was hired. He hasn't done a ton. He's been the GM of Belleville. Um, that's kind of been his role so far. And Elliot Friedman also mentioned his name and said that he's kind of widely regarded as one of those next guys up to get their first GM job. So what do you think of Ryan Bonus? We'll start with you, Paul. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. He's he's look. I've heard he's done some good things in in Ottawa. He's highly regarded, as you point out. He was GM uh, down in Belleville, uh, yep. mostly from a scouting background. Uh, yep. So, you know, it, you mentioned he, this is a next step up for him. I don't know that I, if I were Steos that I'd want to take that kind of risk you know yeah. but um but he does know the organization well so knows the history so yeah he, he'd have to be given consideration for sure yeah and, and i think that's the biggest thing is have to be considered is the biggest part because you have to he's internal he's already there um and i like yeah you got to at least consider him dayton what do you think of bringing in ryan bonus as the gm i think if you want the easy quick fix you bring in ryan bonus Maybe he's great, but he's also got the same background as Pierre Dorian, and he's got the same training under Pierre Dorian. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. If you want a new face, 
you don't want bonus because he's more of the same. I mean, maybe he's great. Um, but I don't know. It, there's, there's too much same, same. I agree. Um, Paul, you'll probably know this name better than anybody just because you're a lot older than us. <laughs> um, John Ferguson Jr. So he spent time uh, with the Toronto Maple Leafs as GM. He spent time, he spent a lot of time as the director of scouting with the San Jose Sharks, I believe. Um, and he's just been, he's been everywhere. He's done a lot of AHL GM jobs. Um, what do you, his name has been thrown around a few times as kind of another one of those guys to get back into the GM's men's club. Um, Paul? What do you think? Well, yeah, you're right. I am old. I remember uh, John Ferguson, his father, was, uh, you know, a tough guy. Good good hockey player. But, yeah, I used to admire him when he was with Montreal. But Ferguson, uh, the thing that comes to mind is one word. Why? Um, yeah. You know, he um, he was GM of the Leafs for five years, 03 to 08. Yeah. Nothing really happened under his tenure. And he never... Well, since that time, he has not worked as a GM. So, I, why? Yeah, yeah. Dayton. Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty similar uh, to Paul here. Like, what can you point out on his resume that's like, yes, this guy did it. His time in the Leafs was pretty unremarkable. He was director of professional scouting with the San Jose Sharks. He was director, or he was a scout for the Senators from 93 to 96. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How's that, that drafting? Yeah, like, okay, maybe Alfredson. Was Alfredson during that time, or was he after? He was, was 96. Yeah, they, he was 96. 96. Or is that when he won the Calder? I might be getting some stuff Ooh. confused in my head here. Um. Embarrassing. Anyway. That's a trivia question. Yes. Don't look up the answer. Oh, now I want to look it up. Um, yeah, like he's a guy who's just one of those names that's been around forever. And maybe there's a reason why he's not in the front of the office anymore. You know? Yeah. That's yeah, no, I I'm right there with you. It's it's been this long. There's got to be a reason, and I don't. I don't imagine he gets the position. All right, pop quiz time. Uh, when was Daniel Alfredson drafted? Ninety five. Ninety four. Sorry, I'll change that. Can I do that? Yeah. Because I think he won the Calder in ninety six. So I'm gonna go with. It was something like the like the fourth or fifth round in ninety four or ninety three. It was the sixth round of nineteen ninety four. So you both kind of got that right. You said ninety three or ninety four. Um, yeah, I was thinking ninety six, but that was the Calder year for him. Yeah. Um, that's what I was yeah. getting confused. So embarrassing stuff on us for not knowing that off the top <laughs> of our head. So we'll have to polish up on our nineteen nineties Ottawa Senators draft history. It's um, not pretty. <laughs> no, it's not pretty. Um. All right, so the next two I'm going to kind of bunch together. Bruce Garriott threw this one out in an article with the Ottawa Sun. Two agents. So we just saw that Michael Ann Lauer and his part portion of the Montreal Canadiens hired Kent Hughes, who was an agent, as the general manager of the Ottawa Center or Montreal Canadiens. Sorry. Um, a lot of people have said that Ann Lauer was one of the people that were kind of on board with that and pushing for Kent Hughes. Now, is it because of Ken Hughes' resume, or was it because he liked that agent side of things? I don't know, but he's not opposed to it. So these names being thrown out there are kind of worth it, I guess, at this point. Um, Alan Walsh and Craig Oster, what do you think, Dayton? I think if you want a new, new face who's going to really change things, those guys are great options. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Alan Walsh is pretty much said he never wants to be a GM because he's too focused on fighting for the players. As yeah. a GM, you kind of have to fight against him. That yeah. goes against what he has made a career doing. Now, yeah. of course, if someone puts a check in front of you and says, hey, do you want to do this? That yeah. changes a lot of opinions really quickly. Um, I don't think it would be a bad option. 
yeah. either of those guys. I just don't know of Craig Oster as well as Walsh because of, um, you know, one is in the media and one is not as much. Yeah. But I don't, yeah, I don't know if the Senators want a brand new face yeah. of things right now. I think that would just make things a little bit trickier. No, maybe they're up for the challenge, but I don't know. It's that's a big risk right now. Yeah. And the, the only thing I have to say to defend that, which I actually already have a counterpoint for my argument, um, would be that you have Steve Steos in that president of hockey ops role to kind of work as a tandem, that two headed monster and Lauer talked about. At the same time, this is Steos' second year in the NHL as one of those really high positions. So he was an associate to a GM uh, or special advisor last year with Edmonton. Now he's in president of hockey ops. It's quite a big jump really quick. Um, so he's not experienced at the NHL level by any means um, in a managerial role. Paul, what do you think of an agent coming in, um, specifically Alan Walsh or Craig Oster? Well, you know, obviously they'll bring negotiating experience. They understand how to negotiate with players, how to buy them, if you will, purchase them on the open market, which would be a plus. But to your point, uh, I, I'm not aware of any significant management experience in terms of managing an organization the size of uh, the Senators. But as yeah. you point out, Steos may bring that. So you've got the that that duo there that that could work. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a bit unorthodox, a bit of trivia. Apparently, uh, Oster reps, um, he's agent for it to Chuck and Norris. Yes. So. And what's really funny is that um, Edmonton just hired, I can't remember his name. He was a, he was an agent. Um, I don't know. Never mind. I was, I don't have all my facts ready. Sorry. Um, okay. So on, I'm gonna, <laughs> how dare I? Uh, I'm going to throw one more name at you that I don't have written in our notes to prepare for. Uh, Jason Spezza. Oh, I was going to do that. <laughs> um, wanted to throw a curveball at you here. So he spent last year as a special advisor, same as Steos, to um, Kyle Dubas in Toronto, followed him to Pittsburgh. So did Eric Carlson, which is very frustrating from the Ottawa side of things. You got Spezza and Carlson in Ottawa or in Pittsburgh. What do you think? Would you give Spezza a shot? We'll start with you, Dayton. A hundred percent. Um. I think if you want somebody who is new, so a new face, you know, he's not an old kind of member of the boys club like uh, John Ferguson Jr. If you want somebody who has shown that they are dedicated to like learning about the game and the managing part of it, and you want somebody who's familiar with the organization, Spezza is the perfect answer for all those three. I think he's a fantastic option. I think pulling him out of uh, Pittsburgh would be tricky. He seems to really like working with Kyle Dubas, yeah. um, as evidenced by him leaving Toronto to go to Pittsburgh with Kyle Dubas. Um, but wouldn't that just be like the perfect image? Uh, Jason Spezza as the general manager of the Auto Senators. That's That's such a good look. And I think... The Senators need a good look, yeah. you know, and he, really he's shown that he has knowledge and he's willing to work for it. Yeah. So I don't know. That's to me, that's a, that's a really good option. Yeah. Well, and then you take him and you throw him alongside Daniel Alfredson, who took a role in right. somewhere in between player development and the coaching staff. Nobody really knows where he ended up, but he's there. Um, yeah. Like that would be a, a, an amazing look for this whole new era of the Ottawa Senators. Mm-hmm. Paul, what are you? What are your thoughts on bringing Spezza back? So Spezza, I don't know uh, enough about his background to really comment. Um, he'd be new to the business of, of general managing things. Uh, you know, there have been players, of course, that have uh, made the transition from player to general manager, and they've done it successfully. No. Uh, is he as hard nosed? And again, I don't know, but is he? Would he be as hard nosed as say? Um, a Stevie Eiserman, for example, you know, well, that's, yeah. uh, uh, that's what I think you're going to need. But as I say, uh, there have been 
uh, players that made the transition just don't know enough about his background to say whether he could. Yeah, and he kind of hides behind the curtain, behind behind Dubas. Um, nobody really ever hears from him. Nobody knows how he's doing. It's strictly just the name brand that people are talking about bringing him back in. And this is even something that Elliot Friedman mentioned, so it's not like I'm just pulling this out of a hat or from user1794 on Twitter. Um, or that Marshall. Yeah, like, yes, that's Brad Marshall's account. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, hey, but yeah, you got to listen to the streets, though. Yes, yeah. always got to listen to the streets. Pay attention to the streets. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting to see the, all these names popping up. Like, that's so many. So, that's seven names that I gave you. Paul, do you have a list in order? Hmm. In order, um, I was going to go out on a limb and put Darsh up there as number one. Um, and I like the two agents, Walsh and Oster. And then I had Shirelli and uh, Bonus and Ferguson, you know, in my yep. bottom three there. Okay. And where would you throw Spets in? Hmm. <laughs> I'll give him a four out of 10. I put him in the middle. Hmm. I'm just, yeah. Okay. Dayton, you got your list? I sure do. Number one, Spezza. That's great. I, <laughs> I just love the idea of Spezza being the face of the franchise again. Number two, Shirelli. I think he's got the most experience. I think he would bring a new flair for the Senators that they haven't had. Yeah, yeah it's it's a good option. Um, Matthew Darsh, third. He's been with Tampa. That's, you know, he knows how to win. Yeah. Um, Ryan Bonus, probably fourth. He's the easy fix. I, he could be a good fix, but there's a bit more of a risk there for me. Um, Alan Walsh and Craig Oster are the same for me at, uh, what is it? Is that five, six? Um, yeah. I, again, they could be good, more risk and they seem more unlikely. And then John Ferguson Jr. is last for me. Keep him away with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> I think that is asking for all of the trouble. Yeah. Uh, I've got Matthew Darsh, number one, Peter Shirelli, number two, Jason Spetson, number three. Ryan Bonus, number four. Again, five and six, I would throw the agents and John Ferguson Jr. in seventh as well for the GM position. If there's another role that he that John Ferguson Jr. wants to come to Ottawa in, sure, sure absolutely. But in the GM role, I don't think so. I don't think that there's much of a reason. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Is there anything else either of you wanted to bring up today? Well, I just want to ask you guys, um, you know, does DJ make it to Sweden? I think we're too close to Sweden He's already got his bags packed. I think that he's going to Sweden. Might be a long cab ride home if they lose two games, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. My take on on him is he's got five games coming up, two of which are in Sweden. I think to keep his job, he's probably going to have to win uh, at least three, yeah. probably four to keep his job. And that just puts him at 500. But it would in the next five games if he won – you know, four games would, uh, or three games anyway, would, would put them over in the 600 range, which is, is right now, if you do the math, that's, that's where they're going to have to play to make the playoffs. So yeah. they put themselves in a real jam. I was surprised he wasn't fired after the six, four loss to Tampa. And then they had the, what, four day break, three day break. I was surprised he was not fired during that break. Um, but here he is. He's still the coach, and they, they play tomorrow and Thursday. Um, I think he makes it through Sweden. After that is thrown dirt in the dark. And I, I give my respect to you, Jacob. You We had that uh, session, I forget, a month ago. You yep. gave him a 10-game leash. I yep. didn't. I think I gave him 20. So yep. uh, I think you're I said 10 games. We're 10 games in, and I think that the leash is – needs to be cut. Yeah. Be interesting. Maybe Dayton, a lot of- yeah, well, hey, there might be a lot to talk about next week on next week's show, right? Could be a good one. Um yeah. all right. I'll throw my prediction in here just uh because yeah. I like to hear myself talk, I guess. Um mm-hmm. I'm gonna offer a little bit of a hot take. Uh-oh. I think Smith makes it until the all-star break. Who? Okay. I don't think he should, 
I think he's proven that the Senators need a change. Everything that I've read so far, and of course, I get it. People say things to, you know, quiet the media. And it's like, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then it's gone. But everything I've read so far makes it seem like Smith is the guy and they don't want to deal with hiring a coach right now. They've got a GM to look out for. I think he makes it to the All-Star break. And that yeah. that could spell the end of the season for the Senators. Yeah. But that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I don't think he makes it the whole year. No, I don't think so either. Um, and remember what um, what Wally said when he was on three months. So that's October, November, December. Yep. Don't think that he said that neither of them will make it to the new year. So far, he's he's one for one. Let's see what happens with DJ. Um, so yeah, we're probably gonna have a whole bunch more to talk about next week. Hopefully, there's some more positive things going on in Ottawa by then. Um, I feel like since we started this podcast is everything's been so negative. Um, I'd love to see just next five game win streak and really have some good stuff to talk about. Um, but yeah, that's going to wrap things up for today. Uh, make sure you go check out the sub stack in the description again. Um, thank you all for watching and thanks. I hope you enjoyed.